know, all of us in our personal and our professional lives, I like to think we sometimes we stand in the shadow of giants. Who, they make a real difference to us in terms of uh, what we do, in terms of advice they give us, the leadership they provide. And today, we clearly have one of those giants of industry with us this morning. So we're very, very excited. Uh, Mr. Edward Whitaker, Jr. Uh, is with us today. Uh, you know his bio. I won't read all of it because you know that you wouldn't be here if you didn't know that already. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, as you know, joined General Motors as chairman uh, when a new company launched in July 2009, and he held that position through December 2010, served as chief executive officer, and we'll be talking about the leadership role that he had there and what he did in terms of his vision for GM and the auto industry. He was also chairman and CEO of AT&T from 1990 through June of 2007. What an incredible time uh, as SBC Communications grew into uh, what we know, know of now as AT&T. He currently serves on the board of ExxonMobil Corporation. He served as a member of the Business Council, the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee, and the boards of the Institute for International Economics, Anheuser-Busch Companies, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Corporation, and the PGA Tour. Mr. Whitaker graduated from Texas Tech University with a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering, but what we most fondly know is that he's a parent of a TCU graduate. So, uh, so Ed Whitaker, please join us. Good morning, Homer. Morning, morning. Good morning, everyone. Let's, let's start off and let's talk about, as clearly you've been a CEO of two different companies and worked with a lot of CEOs through the years in different companies and organizations. When you think about the challenges that CEOs face, what, what comes to mind? Well, good morning again. <laughs> Mornings are not my best time. <laughs> and you were nice to say that uh, my daughter's a TCU grad, and Absolutely. that's true. But you also need to know that my wife's from here, I met her here, I got married ah. uh, a mile from here, and I worked for Southwestern Bell Telephone here for, for a long time. Four, three or four years, yeah, yeah so yeah. it was good. So it's nice to be here this morning, and I wish I could take some of this rain to San Antonio, but maybe it will when I go back this afternoon. I think some of the challenges of a CEO, and I think you know, oh, and one other thing, Fro did I hear Frost Bank is a sponsor? Absolutely. Dick Evans is my next door neighbor. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so, I, I see him daily. <laughs> should I, what should I tell him? <laughs> tell him things are okay in Fort Worth? <laughs> okay. Well, that'll make him happy. I think uh, some of the challenges of a CEO these days, and it's probably not changed in many years, is to follow the vision that you have for your company, uh, be able to change strategy and tactics on a dime, do it real quick, be willing to take a risk and think about uh, risk sort of things, uh, do good by the people that work for you because they are the most important asset. So I think those are the challenges. I'm not sure they've changed much over the years, but risk taking, being aware, Homer, mm -hmm. being able to change, being able to kind of look out and see what's going to happen and make a bet on that, take a risk, is probably uh, near the top of things for mm -hmm. CEOs to do. So CEOs also have to sit at the table with a bunch of board members. That's true. And you, you do that with ExxonMobil, and you've done that for many other organizations and companies. So what about the board member role? Is it, does it change? Is it, what, does that, what does that fit? Well, I think the board member role has changed. I've been on a lot of boards over the years. I think it's changed more incrementally than anybody else. There's, there's more concern these days of <clears throat> things like uh, risk management and the board involvement in risk management. One of the things you never want to do is bet your company, but I mean, that's kind of common sense, right? But board members, you think about it, board members are elected to represent the stockholders of the company. 
They don't represent the chairman, they don't represent management, they represent the stockholders of the company, and that's why you have it. And the duties that go with that are watching risk, making sure that the company is run in accordance with rules and regulations. I'm not sure that the charge has changed, but the ability to make sure that's happening has changed, Homer. I think there's more oversight by boards now. You probably get into a few more things. Uh, it, it's definitely changed and it's, uh, it's harder now than it used to be. Are you able to maintain as a board member independence? Because many times you're a close friend with the leadership of the company. And does that, is that a problem at times? Well, I think it is a problem. I think we all read stories of where that's been a problem or could be a problem. But I think if a board member remembers that they're not representing management, they're representing the owners of the company, the stockholders, I think you can be friends, but you still have to remember, you, <clears throat> you have to have a peer that you're representing the stockholders. That's your sworn duty. They elect you. Uh, nowadays, they elect you every year in most cases. And uh, I guess it's an individual thing if it becomes a problem or not. I don't think that's ever been a problem for me. I've always felt like I could be friends and close acquaintances with the top management, but you never forget, you're really representing the owners of the company. With that. Well, I'd, obviously, you've done a lot of different things in your life. What I'd like to do is spend some time on a couple of companies, AT&T and General Motors, but let's start with kind of the AT&T story, and why don't you tell us about, even before we get into the company itself, when you started, how did you start SBC? And Tell us I, uh, that story a little bit. It was Southwestern Bell at the time, and I went to Texas Tech. And uh, you won't hold that against me, I hope. That's <laughs> what I'm close. Uh, incidentally, Fort Worth, I don't come much, but it's still a nice place, and you have a warm feeling when you come. And I came yesterday. And of course, Linda's from here, but it's still a nice place, and you're lucky to be here. And. Uh, I don't know why I said that, Homer. It just struck me as <laughs> but it's you know, true. people are friendly and it's, and it's true. But anyway, uh, I'm from Ennis, Texas, which is uh, about 50 miles southeast of here. Went to Texas Tech. Tuition in those days was 75 bucks, which should tell you why I went there. <laughs> but anyway, went to Texas Tech, uh, studied engineering because I thought you could uh, get a job if you had an engineering degree. Managed to persist and get one. Started to work for Southwestern Bell in 1963 as a lineman. The management theory in those days was <clears throat> you couldn't be a boss unless you knew how to do everybody that worked for you's job. So you needed that. But didn't stay a lineman too long. Got into uh, management at Southwestern Bell. We had a management program. And over the next uh, 30 years or so, not quite that long, 25 years, held a number of jobs, moved about 20 times, uh, sort of all over the United States, with different jobs, mostly in my early and mid-career in the network part of the job. So I didn't know anything about marketing, sales, finance, uh, PR, anything like that, but I knew how it worked. And that was an asset. Mm -hmm. And then uh, strange things happened, and I still don't know how I got to be chairman, but I got to be chairman of Southwestern Bell in 1990. I was president in 1998. And as you say, I stayed there 17 years, and those were an exciting 17 years. A lot of things happened. We had no cell phones in 1990 to speak of. Bell Laboratories, which was a, a, a famous a scientific laboratory owned by AT&T at the time, predicted there'd be one million cell customers, cell phone customers, in 20 years. Wow. <clears throat> one million. And now we have that many, well, I won't say a day, but maybe a week, you know? A lot of cell phones. So, yeah. Interesting things <clears throat> and uh, a lot of interesting jobs, a lot of interesting people. But an interesting time for me when I became chairman. It is Want amazing. Me to keep going. Well, doesn't somebody? I mean, people say now there's more phone numbers than people in the world. I think. I actually, think that's probably it's, right. It's incredible. It's phenomenal. I think that's probably right. So AT and T. You so AT and T, Southwestern Bell, 
And I guess we can use this just to talk a little bit. In 1990, Southwestern Bell was the smallest of the baby bells, which had been split up in 1984. Mm -hmm. An antitrust suit said AT&T was too big, let's break it up. Broke it up into seven regional companies. Southwestern Bell was the smallest, and it, it provided wireline telephone service in Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, and Texas. You could tell right away that <clears throat> when you're the smallest, that's usually not a good thing if you want to stay in business long. And so we decided that we had two choices. One is we could get purchased by somebody else or bought, or we could get big ourselves. And we thought it'd be uh, more exciting, more appropriate for our shareholders to get big. And so we set out on that course. The first purchase we made was the Mexican telephone company, Tel Telmex or Telefonas de Mexico. And I know we mustered up the nerve to put a billion dollars in that. You didn't have to be a genius to see that Mexico could be good. There weren't many phones. If you had one, you'd waited six months to get it. If it uh, was in trouble, it took six months to get it repaired. There was a huge demand in Mexico. The government owned it. They wanted to privatize it. We decided to buy it along with a Mexican partner. Uh, we put a billion dollars on the table. The stock, our stock, Southwestern Bell, dropped $7 the next day. And I said, I'm going to be the <laughs> shortest lived chairman in the world. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a harrowing time. But a week or so later, the stock boomed back up and Telmex became a wonderful investment for Southwestern Bell. Still, AT&T still owns it and it's paid it for itself many, 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 many times over and is one of the largest uh, wireless companies in the world now. But our next target was California, Pacific Telesis. And uh, does anybody remember the name AirTouch? Huh? AirTouch was a wireless company owned by Pacific Telesis, and it was spun off because the chairman at the time didn't want any regulation. So he spun it off of Pacific Telesis, leaving a, just a wireline telephone company in California and Nevada. And so I looked at California, several of us, I say I, but several of us looked at that and said, well, here's a wireline telephone company in California. A lot of people out there, a lot of traffic on the road if you haven't been lately. But what they had that nobody saw was they had the licenses to rebuild all that wireless. They didn't have any towers, they didn't have any stores, they didn't have any mobile phones, but they had the licenses to rebuild all that. And so, <clears throat> It might have looked like a smart move, but it, it really takes no genius to see if you could rebuild that wireless in California along with the wireline, given all that traffic, car traffic, and the price was right. Maybe we ought to take a risk and buy that and double the size of Southwestern Bell Telephone Company overnight. And so over a tuna sandwich in an airplane hangar in Phoenix, Arizona, their chairman and I made a deal. And we bought the Pacific Telesis Company and started to rebuild the license or, or the wire, <coughs> wireless part. And uh, turned out pretty good. I mean, <laughs> turn, turned out real good, you know. It was a, <laughs> Is there any genius involved in this? No. But you could see that I knew that the technology in wireless was there for it to get much bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a personal communications device. And I didn't think it took a genius to figure out if this stuff worked, all of you and I would have a phone with us all the time. Back in those days, it was the razor phone, the flip phones, mm -hmm. the briefcase phones, the bag phones. But you could see the technology was coming, Homer, mm -hmm. and that everybody would have access. It was going to be reasonably priced. This would be a great consumer product. And so we made the decision early on, we were going to get all the wireless we could get, and we were going to get it quick. And uh, 
call it risk taking, whatever, mm -hmm. but we took that risk and it paid off because we acquired a lot of wireless over the years. So how, when you're acquiring so many partners and other companies, how do you keep a focus as a company? And that's a very different culture, as I'm sure, that you're trying to merge together. And what, how do you, what do you do with that? How do you deal with that? Well, the culture thing is interesting. <clears throat> and you hear that talked about, two companies, different cultures. I never found that to be the case. Uh, we all hear that California is a lot different than Texas, right? Or the people there are. And some of that's true, I'll tell you for sure. <laughs> But we never really focused on the culture. We focused on the product and the brands, and culture was never a problem for us, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we strongly believe that <clears throat> people are people, and people want the same thing no matter where they are. And they want the same that you and I want. They want to be successful. They want to feel like they're a part of an entity or a company. Uh, they want to have authority to do something. And if you don't give them all that, you build a bureaucracy overnight, I'll tell you. <clears throat> but if you involve the people, give them responsibility, and you might talk different, you might uh, think a little bit different, but if you clearly outline the vision, leave some of those people in charge, give them the responsibility and authority to do the job, because all of us want to be involved, right? I mean, we don't want to feel like we're not on the inside or not making decisions that affect the company. We all, we all want to be a part of that. So we would do that. We would take the top management in a California or Illinois or wherever it might be with a different culture. Our vision was to become the biggest and best telecom company in the world. Everybody knew that. That's the mission we were on. And anything that didn't pertain to that, you know, we, we weren't interested in it. And then we would empower those people, hold them accountable, give them responsibility, and really try to work the people side of it. The culture thing never was a problem for us, Holman. Very interesting. Never. Yeah. Let's, let's move for a while. I'm not, well, open to the audience in a few minutes. Am I but, talking too much? No, this is great. Love okay. it. So, um, we'll open to the audience in a few minutes, but let's, let's switch over to the auto industry. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a, wow, what an industry. Um, one of my friends when I was at Miami of Ohio years ago, John Smale, came from Procter & Gamble. He sure did. Came into to GM at the time, and, they, and he and his team and group brought this idea of brand management. Does that fit the auto industry? Yes and no. How's that for there an answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, brand management works in some good ways with toothpaste and cereals and Fritos and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it worked okay in the auto industry, but not great. This is just an outsider's opinion that barely knew what brand management was. I mean, I'm not a marketing guy. So I'd have to say the results would be mixed on that. Uh, most auto companies are still on the brand thing and managed by brands. It, uh, it has some good things, it has some bad things. You have a lot of duplication, you set up some things that probably you shouldn't, but it is what it is and that's the way it works and it's pretty much a brand management industry. Because it clearly was what their thrust was when they came in from a very different industry uh, coming in there. Then we all saw the Japanese and they came obviously heavily in the auto industry. They began to change the way we and they looked at the industry in many ways, didn't they? They did. Okay. As I said, when I went to General Motors, I'm not a car guy, but all I know is to turn one on, you know, <laughs> that's about it. And I got the call from the Treasury Department that said, Ed, we'd like for you to become be chairman of General Motors. And it didn't take me long to say, no, I'm not <laughs> gonna do that. <laughs> because I had just retired from AT&T after 44 years, but the Treasury Department called back the next day and said, we'd really like for you to be chairman of General Motors. And I said, no again, but why would you <laughs> want me? And they said, well, you've run big companies before. You've run companies with a unionized workforce. 
and the fact that you don't know anything about the automobile industry may be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and I still said no. <laughs> and the third call I got was, you should look at this as a public service. <laughs> this, is, this is a great industry. We can't let General Motors go. And you know, I agreed with that, Homer, because yeah. my family had been GM owners of Chevys and Pontiacs. And, and so I got to thinking about that and said, okay, I'll come give it a shot. And so that's sort of the genesis of how all that started. When I got there, I found out that the mindset at General Motors for some period of time had been, I asked one of the top guys there, I said, what went wrong here? What happened? You know? And he said, well, we didn't do anything wrong. The economy got us. And I knew right away we had a problem <laughs> because it hadn't gotten anybody else, you know. It got Chrysler, but it didn't get Toyota. Yeah. It didn't get anything. Yeah. Not many years ago, General Motors had over 50% market share of the automobile industry, and it was down to less than 20%. And the mindset there was sort of, we know how to build cars, we don't really care about what the consumer thinks. We're not going to try to get on the edge. Let's just make what we make and people will buy it. Pretty basic era, you know. Consumers are who you sell to. So I think what happened, Homer, is Toyota and others recognized that. General Motors probably recognized it, just didn't act on it because it was so contrary to their, to their culture, if you would, mm -hmm. that they just kept churning things out and uh, people yeah. quit buying them. Yeah. Toyota and the others changed all that with options, some styling changes, some unique things, and General Motors didn't do that. It's been said that General Motors didn't change because it was headed by series of CEOs who were from finance. Are you a finance guy? No. <laughs> I don't know if that's right or wrong, but for whatever reason, General Motors had the mindset of, we at GM know what's best. We're going to keep doing what we know what to do. And they forgot about you, the consumer, the markets. They just thought their way was the best. You know, my, my, actually my college roommate, Irvin McKeever, is a Frost guy, and he's a, he knows that when I was here as a student, I had an orange Cutlass Sierra. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you didn't it bring it amazing. back. But you didn't bring it back. No, we didn't bring it back. And you would be amazed at how many people want 56 Chevys back, 55 Chevys, <laughs> You know, GTOs, et cetera, et cetera. Not possible to do anymore, but there's a lot of nostalgia yeah. around cars. There's a great yeah. deal of interest exactly. in automobiles. AT&T is obviously a global... Incidentally, if anybody here wants a new car, if you'll see me after this meeting, <laughs> I get you a great discount. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not kidding, though. <laughs> AT&T obviously was a major global company. Uh, GM works in a global industry as well, obviously. And I think one of the things that Japan, the Japanese automakers did is they, I think, I think approached the world in a, if you will, a uniform way. They didn't, they, they brought the same product across the world. Right. And GM wasn't doing that, right? No. At all. GM was doing it GM's way, mm -hmm. and that was the right way in their mind, and if you didn't like it, you didn't have to buy it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't buy it. Mm -hmm. And there is the reason. Yeah. And GM lost their reputation, further lost it uh, in the bankruptcy. People were so embarrassed that worked at GM after we went bankrupt that it was pretty easy to ignite everybody and come and, and to get it back. And I guess we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute because mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. an interesting story. Mm -hmm. But they brought it, Toyota brought it worldwide, Honda brought it worldwide, lots did, Volkswagen, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And GM just didn't do that. Mm -hmm. 
for whatever reason. So, so how did you approach it? When you, if, I know you talked about the consumers, but so what was your strategy or when you got there? Strategy going into GM. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to GM and uh, asked what was wrong, and uh, the economy goddess was one answer. I asked uh, one of the other senior managers, I said, what's really important here? He said, I don't care about anything, but are the bolt holes in the chassis in the right place? I swear that's what he said. <laughs> I'm from the telephone business, you know, I didn't know anything, but he said, if the holes line up, I can attach the body to the chassis. And I said, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> And, you know, they had violated rule one in business, which is revenues have to exceed expenses. <laughs> I mean, it's simple, but we teach forgotten that. that. You, <laughs> teach, you do teach that. That's good. <laughs> revenues have to exceed expenses, rule one. But uh, as going across GM, I found that people didn't know, some of them didn't know who their boss was because they had a matrix style of management which meant you had more than one boss, and in some cases three or four, and therefore no accountability. Uh, I asked them what we did here, and some of the senior people couldn't tell me what the purpose of General Motors was, as strange as that might seem. And so, being a simple guy like I am, we tried to fix this in a Relatively simple way. There were no organ. I asked one of the senior managers for an organization chart just to see how the company was put together. Didn't have an organization chart at GM. They had discontinued the HR function, human resources function, to save money. There you go. That's pretty interesting, huh? <laughs> Real interesting for me since I didn't know anybody there. But anyway. <clears throat> We got, I got all the senior management in a room, and we changed a lot of the senior management real quick. And it sounds brutal, and I guess it was in a way, but we had to have the right set of people there. What is, what do we, what is it we do at this company? And we beat that around for 15 minutes, and the chief engineer said, well, we, we should be designing, building, and selling the world's best vehicles. And I said, you know, that's it. Everybody can understand that from the assembly line worker to the top person can understand we should be designing, building, and selling the world's best vehicles. That's our vision. And we proceeded to convey that vision to everybody in that company in the, most, in the hardest way possible. I mean, walking assembly line worker to assembly line worker. And the workers were embarrassed, gone bankrupt, their neighbors wouldn't speak to them, their kids were having trouble in school. You work for GM, you're bankrupt, you don't have any money, I don't want you for a next door neighbor. You just wouldn't believe it. So the people were anxious for something to happen. Good. And so we did that and then we proceeded to do away with the matrix management in one day. And instead of having three bosses, you had one. And then we empowered the people by giving those individuals in the organization the, uh, the responsibility for a specific job, the authority to do that job, which you have to do, and then to hold them accountable. And the quality of the GM products got fixed almost overnight, Homer, mm -hmm. almost overnight and people started to be energized. We came out of bankruptcy. I became chairman in December. Everybody said it'll be two years before you make a nickel. We made a nickel in the first three months. We made a billion dollars, and people started to see that this could be done. So we simplified things a great deal. We had a vision we empowered the people, we sort of got out of the way. You know, we, we had some pretty good designs coming. And so it's, you know, it's certainly not complicated rocket science stuff. But I did learn or relearn a lesson I already knew, and I had known it forever, is that people are the most important asset of your business. And if you empower them, give them the authority to do something, 
you can accomplish miracles in very short periods of time. And so GM went from not making any money to making a lot of money in three months, six months, nine months. Then we went on to the IPO a year ahead of schedule. But the people were terrific, and they're the ones that got the company that turned happen. around. Yeah, that's terrific. Let's open it to the audience. I've got a lot more I could ask, but questions that you might have. Yes. You have to speak loud. My ears are not good. Mr. <laughs> Tinker at AT&T said it's coming on a direction which has resulted in it becoming the dominant player in the telecommunications industry. I'm wondering if you believe that at some point it will again be subject to any trust uh, legislation, and if so, what is the impact going to be both on consumers and the stockholders? The questions, did you get that? Okay. Who planted that question? <laughs> well, we set out at AT&T to build the biggest and best telecom company in the world, and we, we were lucky enough to accomplish that. I think there's so many competitors now in the wireless industry that antitrust will not be a concern. It may be a concern on how much more one can acquire, but I think in the present mode or close to it, that won't be a question again. I think in the wireline mode, I don't think it'll be a question either because there are a lot of competitors out there now. Uh, the way data is growing and growing exponentially and handled by both wireless and wireline, there are alternate ways to do something. And so I don't think in the future the regulation, antitrust concerns that have been there in the past will continue to be there. I just don't think that'll be a problem. And therefore, I don't think that's an impact on stockholders or anything going forward. There's another that's, hand. That's what I think. I think there's one more hand right behind. Yes, sir. Uh, how did you handle with GM the union weight of uh, the debt and the obligations you had with them in order to go forward? negative factor, I'm sure. Well, the union part was, uh, we had very good union relations with, at AT&T, with Communications Workers of America, a large union. Uh, I grew up in a union family. My dad was a member of the union, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers, which was viewed as a, a tough union to get along with and a difficult union, but so I was pretty much used to the union thing there and at AT&T. One of the first things I did at Detroit was get in my car, drive down Jefferson Avenue to Solidarity House, and introduce myself to the president of the United Auto Workers, a man named Ron Gettlefinger, who had been vilified pretty much in the press. I found him to be a most impressive guy intelligent, willing to work with, with management, if you would. He said, you're the first guy from GM that's ever been in this building. It gets back to people, I thought. And he said, what can we do to help? I have to give the union a lot of credit for getting GM back so quick. They were most helpful to me. Uh, they were easy to work with. Of course, they'd been through bankruptcy too. But I found that the relationships between the United Auto Workers and General Motors wasn't what it should have been. Uh, GM had, had dedicated union relations somewhere down in middle management, and they never saw a top executive. I spent a lot of time with the unions in the assembly, uh, on the assembly lines and meeting with them. And yeah, you, we had our disagreements, but I'd have to say that the unions were a big help. That may surprise you, but they were a big help in turning GM around quick. And I think it again gets back to, this is just my opinion, the same thing, a union worker and management, they want the same thing. They'd like to make enough money to buy a house, send their kids to college, feel good about what they do, participate in the success of a business, be involved. It's not everybody, but 99%. And I think if you approach it that way, 
and deal with them on the proper levels, uh, the union was very helpful with Jim. And Ron Gettlefinger and I became friends. I invited him to the board meetings and the board dinners, and we talked a lot about what he had going and what we had going, but they were helpful, Homer, mm -hmm. in turning the company around. It's all about people in a business. If you're not good with people, if you don't, they are your most important asset, and if it's not right, you will fail if you don't have that relationship right. I don't know when, it may take three months, six months, three years, but if you're not right with the people in the company, you don't make it, my opinion. You just don't make it. Yes? In General Motors, what was the first pivotal moment where the employees got to recognize that the vision could actually happen and not just be conversation? Well, I think we talked it up pretty hard and didn't give them time to think much in the first two or three weeks, <laughs> you know. But I think uh, the first time we, we reported, instead of a huge loss, which we'd had a loss every quarter for five years, I think at the end of the first three months when we reported that we had made money in the first quarter, I think people, the light came on and said, this can be done. And I think that was the first moment that the entire company realized that, hey, you know, we can come back. This can be done. This is a good thing. Right away, we paid the loan back to the government. The government had two parts. They owned stock, plus they gave us a loan. They loaned us uh, $7 billion and then bought a lot of the stock. We paid back the loan in three months, the $7 billion. We made a big deal out of that. We told everybody in the company from the lowest worker to the highest that we had paid this back four years ahead of schedule. <clears throat> and I think publicizing that and publicizing the first quarter's financial results went a long way in, hey, we can get this back. And it was easy for, sort of for me and others, because these workers were embarrassed. I mean, these are good people on the assembly line. I had read all the stories about, you know, the workers and the unions. But as I got out there to meet them and to talk to them, these are good people who were very embarrassed at having gone bankrupt. And they were anxious to prove to the world that they could do as good as anybody else, if not better. So having the vision, I think empowering them, put the right people in the right management jobs and jobs in total just worked miracles. Yes. How significant were the difference in legacy costs between, say, Toyota and General Motors? How significant were they in getting GM into problems? Uh, you know, that's a much debated subject. I'm not sure I know, but I have what, I, what I've been told is about $5 an hour, somewhere in that range. So the legacy costs were significant. But there are ways to compensate for that, you know, with efficiencies. And of course, they'd gone through bankruptcy, that helped a lot, but locations, et cetera. You know how many, you know how many different parts there are in a car? Would you say 150? It's like 7,000. I have to say this, Homer, it was the right thing for the U.S. government you and I to bail out General Motors. If we not done that, there are so many outside suppliers to GM that we would have lost millions of jobs in this country. Not at GM. The workers there were, you know, relatively small number. But all the suppliers to that company was incredible. If we had not done that, you and I, we put our tax dollars in it. If we had not done that, there would have been literally millions of jobs lost in this country. And GM's paid now a lot of the loan back to you and I. They have more to go. They will pay it back before much longer. But it was absolutely the right thing to do. The legacy costs were significant. I don't know that it